Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu, and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Should police be able to seize a $42,000 car that they say was used to transport a few hundred dollars worth of drugs? It's a case the nation's highest court will consider, and it started right here in Grant County. Ahead, part one of our series on civil forfeitures. Plus, there's a truck driver shortage. At the end of 2017, the American Trucking Association um, shared the number of 50,000 as the driver shortage. A proposed bill authored by an Indiana congressman would allow younger drivers to enter the industry, but critics say it won't solve the problem. Former President Jimmy Carter and his wife are in Indiana to help build nearly two dozen Habitat for Humanity homes. It's a kind of an impenetrable barrier between the two. And we found that uh, Habitat for Humanity is the easiest and most natural way to break down that barrier. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. And Indiana law allows police to seize thousands of dollars worth of property if they think it's involved in a suspected crime, regardless of whether the person who owns it is ever convicted. The country's highest court is set to hear a challenge to one aspect of that civil forfeiture law later this year. Reporter Barbara Brozier joins us now. Barbara, what's this case all about? Well, a Marion resident named Tyson Timms claims police violated the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause when they seized his vehicle worth more than $40,000 because he used it to transport a few hundred dollars worth of drugs. The case will go before the U.S. Supreme Court this fall. And while it started as an, as an attempt to get his vehicle back, Tim says it's now about something bigger. The driveway where Tyson Timms lives sits empty. It might sound silly, but it, it, it hurts my self-esteem. Uh, I'm a grown man that doesn't have his own vehicle. Tim's did have a vehicle five years ago. He used more than $42,000 in life insurance payments after his father died to buy a Land Rover. Police say he drove that car between Marion and Richmond several times in 2013 to buy or sell heroin. It was something Tim says he did out of necessity to fuel his own addiction. I had ran out of my life insurance money and I, I didn't want to be sick. You know, I, I had a little bit one day and a guy called and said, I have some people that, you know, want to buy some dope. And I, I took the chance. But one of the buyers ended up being an undercover detective. Court documents say Tim sold heroin to police at least twice for a total of about $500. Police later arrested Tim's and also took his Land Rover. I was angry for a while, you know, it, to be honest, that probably got me through a long time was anger and, and hatred. I hated the police for what they did to me. And I was going to show them, you know, I, I assumed that they probably expected me to fail. While Tim's pleaded guilty to two felony charges in his criminal case, he challenged the civil forfeiture. Tim's doesn't think police should be able to take a car worth tens of thousands of dollars for a low-level drug offense. His attorney argues that violates the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause. The trial court ruled in Tim's favor, saying the vehicle was worth more than four times the maximum penalty he could face in criminal court. And the Indiana Court of Appeals 
also sided with Tim's, saying the seizure was disproportionate to the gravity of the crime. But the Indiana Supreme Court took a different position. The Indiana Supreme Court took the state's appeal and decided, to everyone's surprise, that the excessive fines clause of the U.S. Constitution does not apply in this state, meaning that the state could take Tyson's vehicle, and meaning, in fact, that the state could take any Hughes's property for even a minor crime. That's something the U.S. Supreme Court will now have to decide after it hears the case later this year. But most civil forfeiture cases don't get nearly as far. It's hard to put an exact number on how many cases go undisputed because until this year, the state didn't require counties to report those activities. But experts say more often than not, the seizures go unchallenged. If you seize $1,000, but it costs you $3,000 to get it back, nobody in their right mind is going to fight. They're going to give up. And that's not the only barrier for Hoosiers who want their property back. The seizures are handled separately from criminal proceedings in civil court. That means there's no right to an appointed attorney if a defendant can't afford one. And that's a very troubling notion um, that um, people are losing their property, not because they're guilty of some illegal activity, um, but because it's either too costly or too difficult, too complex, too time consuming to fight back. Hearing those kinds of stories is what motivates Tim's to continue his fight. It's not about getting my truck back, you know, for me. That hasn't been the, the case for me for a long time. Uh, for me, the, 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 this is principle. You know, they shouldn't be able to do this to people. In the years since police took his car, Tim says he's made a lot of changes. He's now clean and even speaks to local and state task forces about his battle with addiction and the criminal justice system. And he has a job, but he has to borrow his Aunt Wendy's car to get there while she takes the bus to dialysis. We don't all have an Aunt Wendy, so there's a lot of people like me that they're stuck. It's those people, Tim says, he'll be thinking of as the Supreme Court hears this case. The court will hear that case in November or December of this year, and it's one of several legal challenges to Indiana civil forfeiture laws. Next week, we'll take a closer look at where the money goes when property is seized and sold and why some argue that violates state law. Okay, Barbara, looking forward to that. Thank you very much. President Donald Trump is urging Indiana Republicans to unseat Senator Joe Donnelly, saying the vulnerable Democrat is not going to vote for us on anything. Trump appeared in Evansville last night to boost support for wealthy businessman Republican Mike Braun in what is viewed as one of the nation's most competitive Senate races. Before a wildly enthusiastic crowd, Trump called Braun a special guy and said he will be a truly great senator. He'll be a great senator. A vote for Mike Braun is a vote to, did you ever hear this before? Make America great again. And he needs a true ally, not somebody that says something when you're, when you're in Indiana and does something differently when you're in D.C. In a response after the rally, Democrat Senator Joe Donnelly said that Hoosiers know he puts their interests before that of any party or individual. Donnelly's campaign cited a study from Congressional Quarterly that shows he voted with Trump 62 percent of the time in 2017 and that he had 22 proposals that Trump signed into law. Now for headlines, Barbara Brozier joins us again. She has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. The Chamber of Commerce says it won't endorse either U.S. Senate candidate. It's the first time the chamber hasn't backed a candidate since it began making endorsements. The chamber's president says his organization shares alignments and disagreements with both Republican Mike Braun and Democrat Joe Donnelly. Political analysts say the chamber's decision could influence the race because it's unusual for a generally Republican organization in a Republican state not to endorse the Republican candidate. The state is delaying the release of 2018 spring I-STEP scores. The company behind the state's standardized test, Pearson, says a problem arose with the 10th grade math question and some student responses on the written exam. The department initially scheduled the release of the scores for the state board's September meeting. 
they will likely convene for a special meeting now to receive the results once they are finalized. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says it will initially send farmers half of the $12 billion promised as restitution for damage caused by President Donald Trump's trade war with China. The aid will help Hoosier farmers get through this year, but they worry about what will happen next year. But if nothing changes and we have to go into the following crop at today's prices or lower prices, there's going to be a lot of problems. High yields paired with tariffs on American crops have caused farmers to worry despite President Trump's bailout. A newly released draft from the Indiana Department of Environmental Management details how the agency wants to spend money from a Volkswagen settlement. Indiana received more than $40 million after the company violated the Clean Air Act. More than half of the money would go toward repowering or replacing old diesel freight trucks, school buses, and transit buses. 15% would be invested in electric vehicle infrastructure. IDEM is taking public comment on the revised plan through the end of September. Indiana sheriffs say they need more money to house Department of Correction inmates. Counties get $35 per day for every level six felon they house in their jails. That stayed the same for 30 years. Meanwhile, the number of level six felons in county jails has increased about 37% in just the last year. The Sheriff's Association is lobbying legislators for an increase to $55 a day. That increase would cost the state about $45,000 more per year. State lawmakers acknowledge more needs to be done for people who are living with a disability or taking care of someone who has a disability. Seven legislative candidates participated in a forum this week. They answered questions about health care access, workforce development opportunities, and disability support in schools. We have also increased uh, funding for the severely disabled students. We went up 2% in 18 and another 2% in 19. And that's not a lot. And we need to keep working on that. And we acknowledge that. When it comes to social services, we're just told, sorry, we don't have enough money. And by the way, ignore that large surplus sitting over there in the corner. Yep. We're going to keep that where it is. So it's just a matter of political will for us to set the right priorities and do what we need. For his part, Pierce says he hopes to prioritize funding for social services and disability resources when the legislature resumes in January for its budget-making session. A sign with the words, we love you, period, summed up the atmosphere at an overdose vigil this week in Bloomington. The fourth annual event coincides with International Overdose Awareness Day. Indiana Recovery Alliance Director Chris Abert says community events like the vigil help reduce the stigma surrounding addiction. What is actually going on? What do these people actually need? What, is, what does it look like in their lives? You know, what is it, what's the experience of grief? Uh, and then the experience of not being able to share that grief uh, because people judge the way that you lost your loved one. Indiana saw one of the largest increases in opioid overdose deaths in the country last year, growing by more than 17 percent. At the vigil, people currently struggling with addiction could get supplies, support, and information about treatment options. Well, the Indiana football team opens the season on the road Saturday night. Their first home game is next weekend. What weekend athletic officials are promising fans that it will be easier to get to Memorial Stadium this season. I-69 construction has been delaying traffic since it started four years ago. Officials say all four lanes of State Road 37 and I-69 will be open from Indianapolis to Bloomington on game days. I appreciate our a lot of most of our fans fighting through that, but I think maybe some of our uh, uh, you know, some, some fans, um, that was, a, that was a, a decision maker not to come. Well, that is over. Glass says IU Athletics worked with the Indiana Department of Transportation and Governor Eric Holcomb to make sure all four lanes would be open. And Joe, today was actually the day that they were supposed to have construction done. The state was. We now know that's not happening. Right. And, you know, as someone told me it's four lanes. They didn't say four moving lanes of traffic. Very so true. we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. Thanks, Barbara.
Former President Jimmy Carter is in Indiana this week helping build homes as part of a Habitat for Humanity project. As Tyler Lake reports, hundreds of volunteers joined Carter and his wife, Rosalind, to build nearly two dozen houses in Mishawaka. Hammers are ringing out in chorus as hundreds of volunteers gather to work together to quickly erect dozens of new Habitat for Humanity homes. They're on a tight deadline, trying to construct 22 homes in just about a week. And amid the chaos, under a small white tent, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter are assembling a stair railing. Carter says they've done projects all over the world, but the Mishawaka event is unusual. I think this has been the best organized and the most pleasant uh, and well prepared that we've ever experienced, and we've had some good ones. Thank you all. The Carters have worked with Habitat for Humanity for over 35 years. Good to be with you this morning. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter says she was impressed that the future Mishawaka Village residents were forming a community before their houses were even built. And everybody knew everybody, and everybody cared for everybody else, and. And that's really special. Uh, I don't think we've ever had anybody say that before. Benito Salazar is out working on the house he and his family will soon occupy. He says he's already developed a close-knit relationship with his new neighbors. We've been side by side with them. We've been working so we know each other. We know the children. We, we've talked and know the struggles that they're having and where they came from. Habitat's mission is to bring attention to housing issues in communities across the country and around the world. One way to raise awareness is getting celebrities involved in the project. And a handful of them could be spotted amid the swarm of volunteers in light blue safety helmets. Garth Brooks, Trisha Yearwood, and David Letterman were all on hand to help with the construction. Carter says Habitat for Humanity offers a rare opportunity to overcome the division between the haves and the have-nots. It's a kind of an impenetrable barrier between the two. And we found that uh, Habitat for Humanity is the easiest and most natural way to break down that barrier. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. It was announced during the event that the donor of the current Habitat land will donate another seven acres adjacent to the land where houses are being erected. Habitat officials say that donation was a direct result of Carter's visit to Mishawaka. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. A truck driver shortage is a growing problem in Indiana and across the United States. Representative Trey Hollingsworth says he has a plan that will fix the problem, but critics say it ignores the real issues in the industry. And we go to Franklin College, where a new volunteer coach is inspiring players from the sidelines. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find Congress. anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. The WTIU-WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU-WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, currently, you can't drive a semi-truck across state lines unless you're at least 21. A bill backed by Indiana Representative Trey Hollingsworth would lower that to 18. The goal is to open up the industry to more people in an attempt to address a growing driver shortage. But critics say the bill is trying to put a Band-Aid on the problem without attempting to address what's causing it. Tyler Lake reports. You might have seen the headlines. The ones like this that say we are experiencing a big shortage of truck drivers. And you'll hear the same thing if you talk to representatives from trucking companies. At the end of 2017, the American Trucking Association um, shared the number of 50,000 as the driver shortage. The association doesn't have current Indiana-specific numbers, but Hunt says as of a few years ago, 
there was a shortage in the state of about 4,500 drivers. It's noteworthy that there's a truck driver shortage when the country is experiencing record low unemployment. And drivers can make more than the national average without having to get a college degree. Nonetheless, trucking companies say they are in constant need of qualified drivers. Garrett Nolman is the safety and compliance officer for his family's trucking company now. But he started out like this, behind the wheel of a big rig. Companies are offering tens of thousands of dollars of sign-on bonuses, uh, but still not covering the whole. According to government data, the average truck driver made about $44,000 a year last year. Compare that with the inflation-adjusted average of just more than $55,000 a year in 1980. That means truck drivers make less now than they did nearly four decades ago. That, many truck drivers say, is one of the causes of the shortage. Trucking's not an easy job. It's long hours and a lot of unpaid downtime. Considering the number of hours that truck drivers work and the conditions they work under, meaning that they're away from home for weeks at a time and they spend a lot of time away from home, missing events, missing family gatherings. Taylor says the turnover for truck drivers is about 94 percent, and she thinks much of that is because of how drivers are paid. They don't pay them by the hour. They pay them by the mile. So they only pay them if they're actually in a truck moving. That means drivers can spend hours sitting in loading docks or waiting in line to receive cargo, and they won't get paid for any of that time. And experts say that even when they are on the road, the per mile rate is still too low. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, drivers are getting between 30 and 40 cents per mile. If they're only working 60 hours a week, that would be really good, right? But to get there, they got to get paid 60 cents a mile, and that's about 50 cents, 50 percent more than they're getting paid now. Belzer says in this market, you have to be an experienced driver to work fewer than 60 hours a week and still bring home a decent paycheck. So carriers say there aren't enough drivers to meet their needs, and drivers say the pay is just too low, and that's why there's so much turnover. But will the Drive Safe Act's goal of opening up the field to younger drivers actually solve that problem? Hunt says that getting drivers right out of high school could be a big boon for the industry. By the time someone turns 21, they may already be in an industry or a career that works for them. So it's a little bit more challenging to get them into the trucking industry. It's a hard sell for young people who wonder whether they really want to invest the time to make truck driving a long-term career. And critics worry that getting young drivers behind the wheel of big rigs is dangerous. Dozens of studies show drivers between 18 and 21 have significantly higher accident rates. The Drive Safety Act does require training for young drivers that isn't required for new drivers over the age of 21. But Belzer says the proposed legislation probably wouldn't bring in many more drivers. Whether it's a driver shortage or incredibly high turnover, all sides agree there's a sense of urgency to find a solution. The average age of drivers on the road now is 55 years old, and that could mean an even bigger driver shortage as those older people retire. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. And as college football season kicks off, much of the attention will be on the players on the field. But as Lindsay Wright reports, it's someone on the sidelines who's inspiring one college team. It's your typical evening practice on the Franklin College football field. Football, good. Come on, German. But the team's newest member of the coaching staff is anything but. Emory Himes has Down syndrome. He's a graduate of a Franklin College program called Inspire, where he took classes with other students. And he's always been a huge supporter of the football team. So head coach Mike Leonard brought him on board as a volunteer coach. But Leonard says Emory has become so much more. I said, Emory, you're not really a coach. And he kind of looked at me a little funny, and I said, you're, you're the GM. And he's like, GM? Great man. And so that has become the mantra, that he's the GM of this team, which means that he's, he's just the great man that's inspiring us all. Leonard says Emory brings an unconditional love to the team, and he hopes it teaches players that there's more to the game than winning. It's about people. And we've got to get to know that every one of us here is created uniquely different. None of us two alike. The message is already sinking in as players prepare for their first home game Saturday. If something bad happens out on the field and some of us are down, having him on the sideline just to, just to see it and to, to know that he's having a great time 
really brings it back down to earth that this is a game and that, you know, we're out here to have fun and he's having fun, so we need to do the same thing. Emery, or Coach E as he tells this group of players to call him, closes out the practice. He tells the players they're a good team and to be a good team at their first game. He'll be right there on the sidelines cheering them on. I, I will be on Saturday game and I want to be a good team player. That's all I got. That's awesome. <laughs> Co Coach E on three? Yeah, yeah, three. Three. On you, baby, on you. All right. One, two, three. Go, Go team! <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu, and by WTIU members. Thank you.